Hi guys and welcome back to the Academy of Historical Fencing and today we're going to be looking at the 1796 Heavy Cavalry Trooper's Sword, both an original and a reproduction. Now, um, this is going to give us a great opportunity to look at an original um, in depth and also look at the reproductions that are on the market. And I say reproductions because there's a big difference between a reproduction which is um, intentionally and overtly intending to be um, a copy and you know it's a copy and that's a different thing to an artificially aged reproduction which then becomes a fake antique and there's a big difference between a reproduction and a fake antique even though the base product might have been the original thing it might have been the same thing originally so yeah we're going to get to have a look at this original and we're going to have a look at the, re uh, the replica so first of all heavy cav trooper's sword uh, this is my um, antique original uh, in really nice condition. Uh, I will say at this point that mine's had some of the common campaign modifications. Now what that means is the Heavy Cavalry Trooper Sword was known to have a couple of issues, shall we, shall we say, is that one, that it was quite cumbersome. Two, is that the point wasn't very good for point work because it had um, a, quite a blunt hatchet tip like that, like the reproduction has. So it wasn't very good for thrusting, it was a little bit cumbersome. And also the, the large inner guard, so the inner is where my thumb is, because uh, so, it's a symmetrical on the original guard, it's a symmetrical guard. It um, gets in the way, it, it snags and wears the uniform down when it's in the, sh in the scabbard. And it, so it just it has a few issues from the factory, shall we, shall we say. And soldiers uh, modified their own swords to improve them. And to some degree, it was also issued on a wider scale. So for example, on the eve of Waterloo, to improve the swords. And it is documented, for example, that um, the orders were given to reprofile the tips. Now, we don't know whether that meant to reprofile them to be a better asymmetric tip like this, or to be a spear point tip where they're com completely symmetrical, and both can be found in antiques. So maybe the order wasn't very clear. It certainly doesn't read very clearly. Um, or perhaps some were field mods and some were the official mod. They're all field mods in, in, in reality. So anyway, with the heavy cav, you'll find that, as standard, they come with this very blunt hatchet tip. And you will find various examples that have improvements to the tip, which sometimes still maintain a completely straight back edge. So if you look at the um, uh, Ensign Newitt sword, who famously captured the, um, the French eagle at Waterloo, he was one of the Scots Grey, very famous account. He had a reprofiled um, asymmetric tip, whereas mine has actually a slightly grand back edge in to go into it. So it's almost going to a spear point, but it's not a symmetric spear point. It's an asymmetric tip. So that's what he had, or at least the sword that we believe that he used. And you will find some that are completely symmetrical spear pointed, and they tend to be a little bit shorter. So uh, the regulation heavy cav sword was 35 inch blade, and spear points can sometimes go down to about 33 inch, whereas um, my one here with the reprofiled asymmetric has only lost one centimeter. So, you know, a fraction of that, you think two inches of loss to one centimeter on this, it's, you know, one centimeter is less than, less than half an inch. So this is almost its complete length. Now it's also had the inner guard cut away. So it still maintains protection to the thumb. There's enough there to protect the thumb, but it's not so much that it gets in the way. And you'll see mine has also had a rolled outside edge as well, which is quite nice. So yeah, it's had a few mods. Uh, oh, and the langets are removed as well here. Now we don't know why they removed them, but we can speculate. I can certainly speculate because I've trained with swords with langets, and I can tell you that opponent's swords get trapped like this all the time. And you might think that, oh, trapping the opponent's blade is a good thing. Well, if you're talking about an offhand weapon, like a sword-breaking dagger, for example, or a buckler with spikes or prongs uh, or, or raised barriers, yes, that kind of trapping is a good thing. But when it's your primary sword, trapping a sword, that is absolutely not a good thing. And it could cause you losing your sword, breaking your wrist, all kinds of nastiness or breaking your blade. So um, personally, I think those langets were just gonna cause issues and they just strip them off. That's my theory. But we certainly know why the inner guards were taken off and why the tips were reprofiled. So that's a look at my uh, original, which is, um, by the way, by uh, Josh Reddle and Co. Um, so a uh, military contractor selling, uh, making swords for the army in Birmingham. And here we have the common reproduction that's on the market today. So they're sold under a few different brands, Universal Swords, uh, Military Heritage, the Night Shop sell one, I think they use another name again, maybe Lantern Armories or something like that. But ultimately they're all about the same. They just differ in how they're kind of weathered or aged, 
so this is one of the Worldwide Arms ones. And Worldwide Arms, they tend to have their blades at hilts and scabbards sort of weathered down. They don't artificially put damage in them like some unscrupulous dealers will. They'll sort of put dents in the scabbards and damage the leather and things like that to make it look like they're antique um, or, or old. Whereas they just, they add a weathering effect that makes it look a bit better from a distance. So it's quite a nice effect without saying this is trying to be a antique. Right. How do they compare? Well, the first thing is, when you talk about reproduction saws, and I've talked about this before, reproduction uh, military saws, sabres, spadroons, that kind of thing, the first thing you'll notice when you pick up a reproduction is they, they handle like a dog, because they have excessive amount of mass in the tip, because they lack distal taper, and they're just too thick. It's not the width of the blade, it's the thickness of the blade, or the depth, if you like, towards the tip. They always have too much, and that means they feel a bit crowbar-like. Now, the problem here is that this is a saw that is known to be a bit crowbar-like. So you might not instantly pick it up and think, oh, that's obviously not the real thing because it handles like a heavy sword. If you look at the reproductions, uh, 1796 Padroons, for example, it would be so obvious it's unbelievable. But when you've got a heavy chopper of a heavy cavalry sword like this, not so obvious. So there is more mass in the tip of the reproduction, but it's not so significantly obvious as some of the other models. Uh, so, yeah. On that note, we'll start there, because that's one of the most obvious tells. So if we look at the reproduction, there is a noticeable secondary edge bevel. So you'll notice this ridge that runs up the blade that isn't the edge. So it almost has like a, um, almost a spine to the blade, which if you look at the originals, they are completely flat. Uh, and that's something that is pretty characteristic of British swords of this period, is they tend to be very flat and thin at the uh, foible, uh, or weak, depending on terminology you use. They can be as thin as one millimeter. Um, on the big cavalry swords, usually about 1.5 millimeters. Whereas you're looking at the reproductions, they can often be as much as three millimeters thick. So as you can imagine, with that much extra steel in the tip, you do really notice it in the handling. That being said, it's not a hugely common sword, so you may not have handled many of these. So it's gonna be hard to have anything to compare it against. So maybe don't work off the handling, work off the sheer look of it. Is you can tell when you look into this section here, after the fuller ends, so this, this fuller here, which is not a blood groove, it is a fuller. After the fuller ends, it should be flat, nice and flat. So that is the first most obvious tell when you're looking at a heavy, a heavy cav, whether it is a reproduction or not. Now that being said, I have seen a few reproductions, very rarely, that do it better. So for example, the swords that were made for the Sharp movies or TV series, they were made better and to better proportions and so it's a little bit harder to tell again but they're super rare and they tend to get sold as collector's items with their own certificate of authenticity the chances are every time you see a reproduction on the market that isn't specifically from the sharp, sharp series it will be from one of these factories that is selling as worldwide arms um, universal swords military heritage all that lot and uh, yeah there we go and they're all pretty much the same as i said what are the tells have we got well, the blades on the uh, original, they are wider in profile. So the width that you can see here, they are simply wider. Now, again, if you haven't got them side by side to compare, that's gonna be a little bit harder um, to compare. And, and the fuller as a result is also a bit wider. So it's something as a visual cue that helps, but maybe if you haven't got them side by side, it's not quite so obvious. But yeah, the, the, the replica is noticeably narrower to the extent that you definitely cannot fit this in the scabbard that came with this sword, nowhere even close. So that's another interesting point. Again, unscrupulous dealers could potentially modify them to make them fit, because it's mostly about the, uh, the throat on the uh, scabbard. So what else have we got? The, the holes that you see in the top of the guard there, on the reproductions, they are really clean and round, like they've been drilled through, okay? Now, they wouldn't have been drilled through, they will have been pressed through, I'm sure, or laser cut more likely. But the point is, is that if you look at the originals, they're not nice, clean circles. Um, they are almost oval in these, these holes here. So that's another obvious tell. What else have we got? Well, the reinforcement plate. So inside the guard on a heavy cab, you have this plate here, which is a reinforcement for the guard. Uh, that's because that's the part taking the most stress on impacts. So it allows you to maintain a fairly thin steel of the guard, or the main part of the guard, and you put this reinforcement plate on and that strengthens up the, the part that's going to take the most abuse. Now if you compare them, the original is way, way thinner 
than the reproduction. Put them around the same way. Again, if you haven't got them side by side, it might not be so obvious, but the difference is significant. The level of the original is about one millimeter and the reproduction is somewhere like two and a half to three millimeters thick. So it's a really heavy reinforcement plate on the reproduction. Now, what else have we got? If you look at the shape of the back straps, you'll notice on the original, it's quite straight. And on the replica, it curls around. Now, that's not an easy thing to necessarily compare because different manufacturers have slightly different shaped back straps. But it is my experience that the originals for these trooper swords, not all British swords of the period because they varied massively, but on these trooper swords, they tend to be fairly straight up the spine and they don't have this bulge, which, um, which appears on the reproductions. Although again, it does appear on some other manufacturers. So don't always use that as a tell. But what is significant, and I've always found this to be the case, is the gap here between the back strap and the grip. On the reproductions, there's a noticeable gap, whereas on the originals, it's just seamlessly put together. Now, of course, as they age and weather, you might find that some of them part themselves. So it might not always be the, the tell, the cue, to tell the difference, but in my experience, it is almost every single time as you've got a really nice, clean fit to the grip, to the back strap. And for that matter, the shape of the back strap on the inner part where it joins to the leather grip tends to be a much smoother, more professionally cut piece or profiled piece than this slightly cruder curve that you get on the back strap here. Now, other differences, if we compare these two uh, side by, uh, knuckle bow, sorry, or, or war dine on, it's flat on my, on my, on my original. And you notice it has this um, basically curled section on the replica. Now that actually is an authentic uh, method of doing it. So some companies did it this way and some companies did it this way. That actually makes some sense because it's, it strengthens the actual knuckle bone. That is the same thin metal that is on the dish here. So it's gonna be prone to taking more damage. It's logical to do this and it's gonna make it a little bit stronger. And nonetheless, on original swords, you'll find a mix of flat and this kind of U-shape bend. So that is not a cue to tell whether it's a uh, replica or not. Although in that regard, I've not seen replicas that have flat knuckle bows like that. So that might help. Okay, what else? Uh, the pins, the pins are really quite subtle on the reproductions and they're really usually quite substantial on the uh, trooper swords. And also, uh, when we look to the, the thickness of the blade at the shoulder, so the shoulder is here, the base of the blade where it meets with the guard, or in this case the leather washer, how thick this is. This is something that reproduction swords very rarely get right. And when I say reproduction swords, I mean military reproductions, because not all swords are the same, but British military swords of this period tend to be about eight to 10 millimeters thick at the shoulder here. There are some exceptions. But even most spadroons are around about eight to nine millimeter here. Again, there are exceptions, but this is a heavy sword. You'd expect it to be broad and it is. And you'll notice on the reproduction that it's a lot, lot thinner. So that's another tell again. Now onto maker's marks. The maker's marks on the, um, on the replicas are the ones I've seen, all of them so far that come from these different companies have the uh, Runkel Solingen marker on the blade. Now, Runkel was a blade importer, so he um, potentially had swords made up and certainly sold blades to other makers. And some makers then fitted up their hilts onto uh, Runkel's blades. So it is entirely possible, in fact, no, not possible, we know for definite that some makers of the day were fitting his blades, and that also some uh, tailors and outfitters were also doing the same. So that's absolutely legitimate. Apart from the fact the way that it's being put on there, it's quite crude. So the blade markers, uh, makers um, stamps were stamped into the blade, and this Runkel marking has been cut into it with some kind of like Dremel tool or something similar to essentially engrave it. And not only is the way that it's tooled is significant, but it looks kind of scrawly like on the sort of, sort of slightly unprofessional. It doesn't have the smooth lines of the originals. So that is a help as well. And again, every reproduction I've seen has the Runkel marking on there. Although originals, some of the originals do as well, of course. But if you see Runkel, immediately stop and think, is it a replica? Because if it's any other maker I've seen so far on the blade, um, I haven't seen the replicas hold any other blade marker. 
That being said, the scabbards are sometimes marked Osborne. Now this one from Worldwide Arms had a completely plain scabbard, so didn't have any marking at all. I've seen some from the Universal Swords company and they have the Osborne marker on there. And some people point that out that, well, an Osborne sword shouldn't have a uh, runkle blade. And um, I'm not sure on that, particularly make, that particular maker, but I know some, for example, Prosser. Prosser put runkle blades on and we know that for a fact. So some makers were putting runkle blades on and also scabbards do get mixed with swords. So even though maybe it wasn't the one it was manufactured with, it still doesn't mean it wasn't used that way in service or whatever else, because the army is not always known to be that precise with keeping things together. So there's a few things to look out for. So you've got mass in the tip, because it should be nice and flat, thickness of the blade at the shoulder, the shape of the slots in the guard, the fit and shape of the back strap where it meets the leather of the grip, the peen section, the thickness of the reinforcement plate, uh, and to some degree the uh, knuckle guard as well. And one other interesting point that I will mention is that all the heavy cars I've ever seen from some perspectives, they look like they've got a small amount of curve. And that's kind of interesting. And I do mean a small amount because they're known to be a straight sword or a straight saber if you really want to use that terminology, which we shouldn't. Um, yeah, they look like they've got a small amount of curve, but I've really had the chance to actually measure it because usually when I get to handle heavy calves, it's museums or antiques dealers or whatever else. So I don't normally get to take measurements, but this one's mine, so I can do what I want with it. And I measured it and actually, yes, it has five millimeters of curve. And that is interesting. Whereas the, the reproduction is noticeably absolutely dead straight. Now I would have to go and look at a lot more examples to test that theory. But certainly when I look at originals and I look at the um, reproductions, the reproductions have that kind of straight up and down, completely dead straight look, which the originals to me generally don't. So there's a little extra for you something worth investigating. So with all that summarized, what is the reproduction like? And is there anything else that you can look out for? Well, simply put, it is actually quite good. I pointed out all the little details about how it's different. And you will notice that almost every little detail is slightly different. And the langets, I noticed some people point out the langets on reproductions are slightly different as well, but I won't talk about that here because I don't have any on this particular example. Um, yeah. It's got minor differences. It's actually a really good reproduction. If you're gonna put it on the wall, if you can use it for reenactment, uh, anything like that, collector's piece, you know, it's actually really good. It looks the part. You've really gotta know your stuff and look up close to tell the difference. And as for the extra bit of mass in the tip, well, if you were willing to take away a bit of metal from that, uh, the last sort of eight inches or so, you could um, reprofile that. It would actually feel just about right. So this reproduction is a 1.2 kilo sword and my original is uh, 1,033 grams. And again, mine's had a reprofiled tip and a bit of metal ground away here. So this was probably something around 1.1 originally. So yeah, if you were willing to just grind off, you know, 50, 100 grams, because there was a range historically on how much they weighed. If you were willing to grind off, I would say 50 grams from the tip, from either side, flatten it out, you would actually have something that handled really closely to the originals. So, um, you know, compared to the originals, it's a good deal, a very good deal. This is one of the most desirable swords out there for the British market, uh, for British swords, and they're not exactly in huge supply either. So um, yeah, often when it comes to British military swords, I would say go for the originals, like light calves, for example, go for originals for, for the most part. When it comes to heavy calves, they cost a ton more money than say light calf savers. And that's not so surprising. Uh, people always ask why, well, Obviously there's the sharp factor, there's the fact that they were used so famously at Waterloo and the famous Lady Elizabeth Butler painting Scotland Forever with the Scots grey charging towards the, uh, the painter or the viewer. There are those factors, but there's also the issue that there were simply less of them. So there were less, uh, less heavy cav units than there were units using light calves because there were 16 regiments of heavy cavalry. I believe there were about 14 through the, through the wars, Napoleonic Wars of light cavalry. But there were a lot more users of the light cavalry saber than just light cavalry because mounted artillery used them and the huge wealth of yeomanry, yeomanry units based back in the UK. So um, there were a lot, lot more users of the light cavalry saber than just heavy cavalry, than just, sorry, light cavalry regiments, whereas the heavy cavalry sword was limited to heavy cavalry. And there were some um, 
extra sword that they use. For example, there's the Household Cavalry Sword that is a little bit different in Guard. So uh, yeah, there weren't that many made by comparison to the Light Cavalry, and they're in huge demand. So uh, yeah, they do go for a lot of money, and if you can't afford one or you want something that uh, you're not going to worry about too much, then this reproduction is actually very, very good. But be very wary, if you are looking to buy an original, of getting caught out by these reproductions. So as I said before, this World Wide Arms one, it's kind of had a nice weathering effect to it, but it's not been damaged and aged in any way that is obvious. One of the common things to look out for in scabbards when they artificially uh, weather them is they just tap basically um, uh, sort of dents into them and they're always so uniform that they're not sort of, they don't look accidental. They look like somebody's got a tool and bashed them into the scabbard and the scabbard otherwise looks pretty good and you can look for other wear marks on the scabbard as well. But anyway, there is the 1796 Heavy Cavalry original by Riddell and a reproduction from Worldwide Arms. It's a really good sword if you want something that is quite affordable and a reasonably good representation. Uh, but be very wary of getting caught out by the, the fake antiques, as I said. This is a reproduction. If it was aged to try and deceive as an antique, it would be a fake antique. And they come up at auction and on eBay all the time. So uh, thanks for watching. Happy hunting if you're looking for an original. Thanks for watching and please subscribe if you haven't already.